Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Healing Ties 2.0, featured on the Whole Care Network and on UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio. I'm your host and presenter, Christopher McClellan. You just might know me as the Bowtie Guy. On this episode of Healing Ties 2.0, I am thrilled to introduce you to my new friend, Sam Timbrook, having served as a pastor and public school educator. Sam's life changed when he became a caretaker for his wife and child. Holding a master's degree in counseling and a doctor of ministry, Sam, like many of us, was not prepared for this life-changing responsibility called caregiving. As a board-certified master mental health life coach, Sam has created a nonprofit program focusing on those who are caretaking and dealing with grief. I know you're going to enjoy my conversation with Sam as much as I did. Let's uh, join our conversation and we'll see you on the other side of the podcast. Well, greetings, Sam, and welcome to another episode of Healing Ties 2.0. It is a delight to visit with you today. Uh, I've been looking forward to this. I appreciate the opportunity. Likewise, you know, we're kind of from, I'm from the, we're from the home state of Missouri, even though yes. I'm in Florida now. And do with all my guests, Sam, I start out by asking, how are you creating healing ties? I'm creating healing ties by attempting to look at the whole picture of caregiving. Uh, you know, some people want to take the educational approach, some the mental health approach, some the spiritual approach, some the physical approach. I take I take it all. And uh, it's helped me heal by learning more and more that maybe what I'm going through as a caretaker, the feelings I have, the emotions, the behaviors are just so typical. Uh, I I follow a, a three in pattern. I say it's natural, it's normal, but it's also necessary. Natural, normal. And necessary. You're right on target there. Caregiving, I hope so. That's going to be the title that, of yeah. that's going to be the title of my fifth book. Of course, I've not written my first four yet, but that's going <laughs> to be the title. It's going to be the title of my fifth book. Well, you've got to, you, you, at least you have a start, you have the title, yeah. but no, but natural, normal, and necessary. You know, I've had the privilege of talking to caregivers all over the world and nobody's quite put it like that before because caregiving is a natural thing that we all end up doing. Right. It's normal in, in a lot of senses um, and it's necessary. Yeah. And, and I know that you've had two, uh, caregiving experiences that uh, yes. that we're going to talk about today. So I'll, I'm just kind of leading you into your, your caregiving story as well. Well, uh, my wife and I have two fine sons. Uh, the second one was born with uh, what we used to call multi-handicapped. In other words, he had a variety of issues. It was quite the shock because uh, we had the best specialist in town and uh, my wife had the amniocentesis and the ultrasounds and all those things. But when he was born, it was obvious he had a lot of problems. And so he, uh, as a result, spent the first three months of his life in intensive care. And then uh, at one point, the medical profession said, uh, maybe you ought to look at uh, institutionalizing him. And they advised us not to take him home. But uh, love said, take him home. Right. And uh, we uh, we had him for forty years. He went f he went far beyond of what they thought he would physically. When he passed, he was probably functioning about a seven or eight year old, something like that. But uh, uh, his main condition was a condition called myotonic dystrophy. But from the moment of birth, he had to be cared for, and even as an adult. He had, uh, he couldn't, uh, uh, well, let me just put it this way. He couldn't care for his own bathroom needs, couldn't bathe himself. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, he could walk some. He spent most of his time in wheelchair. Uh, we were blessed to have an outstanding local public school, uh, and he did graduate from high school as a, um, 
skilled, a special skilled uh, child. But uh, he, uh, the last year of his life, he spent 52 days in the hospital. Uh, but except for those days in the hospital, we had to take care of his ever need. And then my wife, although she had some health challenges over her life, when she turned 60, she rapidly developed some problems. And she was also diagnosed with this same myotonic dystrophy. Oh, goodness. Which is highly unusual at that stage in life. Mm -hmm. But it also kind of explains some of the medical issues she had in her earlier years. But um, her last two and a half years, she either was in bed or in a wheelchair, um, tube fed. Uh, she couldn't care. She couldn't care for her hygiene needs or bathroom needs. Uh, um, you know, without getting too graphic, she even had some special female needs that mm -hmm. I had to take care of. And, um, and then her last three months, she just rapidly went downhill. But, uh, so for a while I had two. And then right. after my wife passed for a few more years, uh, like I indicated, my wife died eight years ago, my son three years ago. For a few more years, I had one. Um, one who was with me and two who were in my heart. That was very beautifully said, Sam. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, one of the reasons why I'm really honored to talk to you and hear your story is uh, there's this misunderstanding is not the right word, but there's this thought that caregiving is just for people uh, that are older, that, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's an elderly issue, but right. uh, I, I would venture to guess, and I, I don't have children, but I'm a favorite uncle to 25, 25 nieces and nephews and 40 great nieces and nephews. But I, 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 I'd like to just kind of chat a little bit about that experience when your son is born and you, you, how do you grasp it, you know, as, as the, the, as a child grows, you're, you're certainly a caregiver per se, but this, this is taking caregiving to the next level uh, uh, for a child. And I, I, I really appreciate you kind of sharing those thoughts and feelings about, um, about that as life progressed for you and your wife and your son. When we brought our child home, everyone had an opinion about his problem, what it was. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, grandma said, well, you know, he's just like your cousin and he had a late start and he's doing fine now. Uh, a fellow pastor, I say fellow pastor, cause I've pastored churches most of my adult life as mm -hmm. well as being in school psychology. But anyway, uh, the pastor said, well, it's a, uh, you know, God will heal. Don't, don't worry. God will heal. And, uh, you know, everyone else had an opinion and, but, uh, not until he was two years old, did it hit us? We had a special, we had a child with special needs. And I never will forget that one of our friends who was, uh, to quote someone else, they were like a velvet colored brick. They, they could really say some things out of love, but boy, did it hit. And that person, when we realized our son was always going to be special needs, short of a miracle, she said, I was wondering when you would learn that, when you would, when, I was wondering, wondering when you would realize that. And then out of the clear blue, we moved to another little town. And one day we had a knock on the door and these two ladies were there. And they said that they were from the local cerebral palsy school. They had heard that we had a child with special needs. Uh, they'd like to talk with us about maybe doing an assessment and see if their program could assist. And we, they were lovely ladies and we talked, but as soon as they walked out the door, my wife and I looked at each other and at the very same moment said, why did they come? <laughs> because even the Mayo Clinic told us our child was delayed. 
what does delayed mean? What does what? Yeah, what does that mean? <laughs> that means right. you know, I was when I, the other day I was supposed to be at a meeting at noon. I got there at twelve fifteen. I was delayed, but I I got there. So, but anyway, long story short, uh, we went on a pilgrimage and went to several different doctors all over the country and things like that, and and uh, got him in the CP school, cerebral palsy school, and things like that. But every time. He should have done something because of his chronological age, but couldn't because of his disability. We went through grief. And our caretaking became more and more overprotective. I would be the very first one to tell you we were overprotective. Mm -hmm. Um, But we saw what happened to some children with special needs who weren't overprotective. And we determined we Mm -hmm. were not going to allow that to happen to our son. But for example, when, when our son turned five and he wasn't going to a traditional public school for kindergarten, we grieved. And it's the same way when he should have been riding a bike, uh, when he got older, the same way when he should have been you know, flirting with the girls. I mean, all those things we grieved over and over and over. And um, the grieving is a part of that normal, natural, necessary, because until we realized what we were doing, until we realized we were in grief, when we did realize it, it just, it changed our perspective. Now, when I say in grief, I'm not, we didn't go around talking about, oh, how bad it is. And you don't realize what we have to do. I mean, you know, we weren't that kind of people because we did see growth, but nowhere near what it should have been. I'm talking about physical and and uh, cognitive and things like that. So, so um, um, sometimes our caretaking included embarrassment. We'd go out in the community and people would say, "Oh, how old is he?" And we would tell them, "They go, oh." Or one time when he had ear surgery and we were going for a follow up visit, and the nurse, uh, our son's name was Ryan, the nurse would say well, Ryan, how old are you? And Ryan said, I'm 29, but he spoke like he was a six-year-old. And the nurse said, oh, I'm 29 also. And I thought, no, you're not. And then I thought, yeah, by the time you're 29, you are a nurse, you are a farmer, you are a teacher, you, you know, you're a business owner, you're a stay-at-home parent. And I, Mm -hmm. I, you know, and so caretaking involves a lot of, a lot of grief. And I think that some of us, when we are caretaking, if we're not careful, we can almost put a cocoon around ourselves right. to try to avoid the pain. And it happens without us really recognizing it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You had mentioned uh, before we started, and uh, you'd mentioned a, uh, another wonderful term in a sense that I'd not heard before, grieving the living. And... Uh, I, uh, even though we've been chatting now for 15, 20 minutes, I, this grieving the living, uh, I, I had not really had heard this before. And it's really touched me as I look back on my caregiving experience. I, I just, I, I'd love to for you to expound a little bit about what you mean by grieving the living. Cause I, I know our listeners are going to love to hear this. Yeah. When my child was, our child was five years of age, my father died and my, he was the first close member in my family who had passed away. And some of the emotions and some of the feelings I had around his death, my dad's death, I kept saying in my mind, I have felt this way before, but where, but you know, with whom, because, and I asked my older brother, I said, has there been any other family members who've died? No. You know, we've had distant cousins and uncles and aunts we never met, but as far as close. And after a lot of thought, and I'll go ahead and say it, prayer and help of a school counselor, Mm -hmm. I realized that the grief I was going through with my dad's death, the reason I recognized it, I was going through it with my son. Mm -hmm. And I was grieving while he was alive. And there were so many similarities because when you are a caretaker, 
you lose a lot. Right. And I know some people, I've actually had some people say, but oh, what a, what a joy to know you're serving your loved one. Okay. I understand that. But uh, it's still caretaking. And you, every caretaker I've ever known has lost something. They've lost their time. They've lost their health, which many caretakers do. They lost their identity. Lost their identity. Uh, they may have had to change careers. It affected my career and everything. So, uh, sure. but I don't think we know it's grieving. I, I guess you could say grieving the living are grieving while they're living. Uh, grieving while you're caretaking. I don't know what the textbook would, would want to call it, you know, but it's, it's, it's almost like death. And we'll, make, sense, we'll make our own textbook. Yeah, there you go. There you yeah. go. And another thing we had to deal with, I did with caretaking my son, uh, our son, but also my wife, especially my wife, because she was much more uh, uh, fragile than my son, is that some of these studies that are out there about grieving, they're just not right. Right. Uh, even Kubler-Ross has said, that she never intended for those, you know, five stages of grief to be bump, 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 bump. I mean, it's more, uh, you know, it, I had a friend of mine said it's more like riding a roller coaster in the dark. <laughs> you took the, you took the words right out of my mouth because you know, that's that's kind of how I, that's how I characterize my grief. Yeah, but, but I think uh, of the people who will watch this video, I think, and I'm not. I'm not bragging or complaining. I'm just stating the fact. I think there's going to be a go. Yeah, that's what I'm going through as a caretaker. That's exactly what I'm going through. And I hope that all of them will do the three ends, ends knowing it's normal, it's natural, but boy, it's necessary. Because I think if you don't realize it's grief, necessarily realize it's grief, I mean, it can, it can eat you up. Grief has a way of, yeah, of eating you up and um, uh, in a, that just binds you. And it, yes. it, 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 it makes you do make poor decisions. It, it, it stops you from stepping into your comfort zone. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think for, and this is another area that I, really kind of excited to talk to you about in a strange sense. So it relates to grief and men because men deal with grief differently than women. Yeah. You know, that, that, that macho man who, you know, I, 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 I can just blow off my feelings and it's, it's okay. That's not, that's not the way to deal with something like this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we men were fixers. Uh, even though my wife, when she was healthy, would hide my tools. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's another video. Um, that, I sure that, there's that. another story. I'm sure that, <laughs> um, but uh, she hit we, we are fixers. We, we grieve. Uh, some textbooks call it institutional grieving mm -hmm. where some people would say women do more intuitive, you know, but uh, I guess, you know, we were talking about uh, grieving the living, I suppose one of my books I need to write someday, it should be called Grieving While Caretaking. Oh, I could write a couple of chapters for you. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Goodness. And then caring for your wife. Uh, that pre-established relationship that had been there for years and all of a sudden caregiving comes into the relationship. I, you know, my listeners have heard me say this time and time again, but it might be the first time that you you've heard me say this, uh, you know, whether it's a spouse or a partner or whatever the relationship is, it's caregiving comes in and it's almost like having two relationships in one that pre-established relationship was there before the caregiving. And then caregiving comes in and it, it, uh, not that it changes the relationship, but it uh, it often takes it to different levels. I'd, right. I'd, I'd uh, really appreciate hearing your 
hearing about your experience caring for your wife as well. It certainly, it certainly changes the priorities of your relationship. Uh, having to care for her, uh, she experienced some days very, uh, very uh, uh, weak, uh, fragile, but often she would express anger because mentally she was fine for up until the last six or seven weeks. And she saw all these things she wanted to do. And she, she, she used to have uh, just gorgeous penmanship. The first thing that left was her penmanship mm. and she'd get real angry over that. And uh, she'd get angry that, uh, that she couldn't do some things. And then uh, with all due respect, her family, her siblings and her mother just didn't understand why we couldn't go to everybody's birthday party and, uh, you know, the Thanksgiving dinners. And often I'd have to call up like an hour before the event and say, well, we just can't be there. And it, it really hurt her, it hurt my wife that her family didn't understand. Damn. Uh. And, uh, Looking back, I'll have to admit, in an effort to protect my wife, I really didn't f explain to her family what she was going through. Uh, so I have to bear a certain amount of responsibility there. And, and I think that's another thing in caregiving. Sometimes in order to protect the person we're caring for and or protect our whole immediate family. Uh, we will, uh, I'm not going to say we hide, but we certainly don't want the whole world to know. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I work for school systems, but I also at the same time pastored smaller churches. And we would have some well-meaning people who would just show up on our doorstep right. wanting to help, which is wonderful. But I emphasize, please call. I mean, because... Uh, if they just show up, she might be sitting in her wheelchair in the living room just with her gown on. Right. And she, you know, and, uh, or maybe I was in the middle of tube feeding her, which would take 30, 40 minutes to do, uh, you know, and, and, uh, so she'd get angry a lot. And I know it was the fear of what may be coming, um, uh, and the anger of what she could no longer do. Right. And um, so, but anyway, seeing her just waste away and her saying, well, why don't you call Dr. So-and-so? I just know I need this toe fixed, you know, and maybe she did have a sore toe, but I would say, well, I'll call the doctor someday because I knew the doctor would say, we're not going to do toe surgery right. on someone who, we, we couldn't begin to do an anesthetizer. And secondly, um, Sam, let's be honest. She's not going to be with us much longer. Right. And, uh, you know, she'd want to go to town and buy a new dress. And I couldn't even get her in the car. But one thing that we did do that, and she just kind of had a day where she felt better, even though she was in a wheelchair, she looked at her driver's license and said, Oh, my license are due soon. She says, take me to the license bureau. So here I wheel in this lady. <laughs> you know, it's funny now. I'm sorry. You, yeah. you have to, you have to, you laugh have to find the, you, 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 you have, have to find, to find well, anyway. Right. So we took her in and she did the vision test and somehow she passed that. Well, anyway, and of course they want to take your picture and, and they had her try to stand up and the guy said, no, he says, we'll do it with her seated. But I can hear in the background, people going to, She's going to be driving, but she shouldn't be by the wheel yeah. car, you know. Yeah. And you don't know whether to just laugh with them or slap them, you know. Exactly. <laughs> you know, or just tell them off or, you know. And, and I thought later if I had had my brain in gear, I would have said, well, you know, she's a lady mud wrestler. She's just resting or whatever. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but the anger she dealt with and the right. times that the times that, uh, uh, I, I had to just say, "Hun, I know, I know." And then she had said, "No, you don't." And and I didn't. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was uh, in one way I was suffering right along with her. 
But I'll tell you this. I'll mm. tell you this. And I'm not trying to sound syrupy sweet. Um, I would not take $50 billion for what I've learned in caretaking. Right. But I pray every day I don't have to do it again. Uh, Sam, I'm, uh, I'm with you 100%. I, I, I believe, and I, you know, we're aligned here. Um, there's no greater honor bestowed on us than to care for somebody else, especially at the time when life transitions. Well, Sam, I think this is a great spot for us to take a break. And when we come back, I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, your ministerial work. So you're listening to Healing Ties featured on the Whole Care Network and UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio. We'll be right back. Everyone has a story. But not everyone gets the chance to share their story. So we're going to give you that chance. We want to hear about your story. We want to know how you're creating healing ties in your life and in your community. Email the bow tie guy at healingties.com and indicate if you'd like to be a guest on the show in order to tell your story to your health, happiness and prosperity. Well, welcome back, everybody. We are continuing our delightful conversation with uh, Sam Timbrook. And Sam, before we went to the break, I indicated I wanted to learn a little bit more about your ministerial background. I went to college thinking I was going to be a high school band director. And near the end of my freshman year, an acquaintance of mine says, well, my little church that I go to needs someone to lead singing. Would you want to do that? So I did. Mm -hmm. And I did that my last three years of college. And the closer I got to graduation, I felt, you know, I don't think I want to be a school band director. I think I'd like to be in church music. So I, after graduation, uh, uh, United uh, went on staff of a rather large church in what a category we used to call in, in our denomination, minister of music and youth. And uh, I wasn't uh, in that position more than six or seven months until I realized that my calling was really working in education, uh, youth education, youth ministry. Uh, as I used to say, not the fun and games youth part, but not a youth activities director, but a youth, right. pastor. youth, youth pastor. And so I went to another church with that emphasis of youth. And uh, uh, two weeks after I got on the scene, the senior pastor resigns. And I was called upon to do a lot of the things the lead pastor, the senior pastor would do. And from there, I really felt called into the pastorate. And so I uh, did some more education. I decided I still needed some uh, counseling uh, education. So I got a master's in counseling. But anyway, long story short, I've always been a part of smaller churches right. uh, by vocational at the same time I did schoolwork. Uh, it's interesting, after my wife and I's son was born, we resigned a full-time church in order to uh, have a working agreement with our denomination that on contract, I would travel the United States and speak to church groups and conferences and training centers, uh, denominational colleges about uh, families with special needs members. Oh. Very and, nice. uh, but that wasn't full time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, so I also did school work, went back into school work. So for 24 years, I was in school and depending on uh, school work and depending upon what state you're in, I was either a school counselor with a mental health emphasis, or I was a school psychologist, um, depending just on whatever state it is. I, I asked a superintendent of schools once, <laughs> what's the difference between what I'm doing as a school counselor with a mental health emphasis and a school psychologist and the superintendent said about $15,000. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I retired from school work 17 years ago, but I'm still with the church. 
right. and still, and, you know, but uh, my, my career changed because when our son was born and as he needed more and more caretaking, uh, it took my, both my wife and I to take care of him. And uh, I, we did, he physically was unable to travel very often. And so uh, I had to stop my traveling. And I say in all humility, I, I was a sought after speaker for conventions, uh, for training in the area of uh, families with special needs or in area of grieving. I didn't know it then, I know it now, that I was often speaking about caregiving. Uh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't connect all of that. And uh, so after my wife died eight years ago, I went on a search for information for grieving, especially for men. I couldn't find what I wanted. That wasn't the uh, cookie cutter variety. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I established my own 501 C3 not-for-profit organization where I uh, work with people online, especially since COVID. So the COVID, everything's uh, still online, uh, sure. And uh, online and also speaking. I'm much more available now to do speaking in view of the fact that with all due respect to them, that my wife and son have both passed away. Mm -hmm. And um, so I don't, uh, I don't do as much as I would like to. Um, I hope it's not because I'm 72 years old. Um, I, I think COVID has just changed the world as far as conferences and conventions right. and, uh, you know, yeah. uh, trainings and things like that. So, but uh, uh, I just uh, uh, find that it's, it's a ministry it's an educational ministry, uh, but uh, with each passing year, I realize more and more it's a caregiving ministry of, of helping people who are caregiving to experience, uh, hopefully, the three ends. The three ends. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the parallel, <clears throat> pardon me, the parallels with uh, caregiving and ministry are so, are, are so clear as far as I uh, uh, and it, when that light went off in your head and you mentioned it a little bit earlier, that, that you were really talking about caregiving. Yes. What, uh, what was the revelation there? What, you know, what, how did that, uh, how did that feel when you, when that light went off and you recognized that that's what, actually what you were talking about? You know, I, I don't, I really don't know whether I can say, it wasn't a burden lifted. It didn't answer a question that I've had in my mind and in my heart. It was like a missing piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. When I realized it was caregiving uh, and grieving the connection, uh, it was like, oh yeah, that's the part I've, that's the part I've been looking for that that's, that's what I'm doing. And that's what I'm helping other people cope with. Um, it was, it, it was just like that feeling all the time, you know, like, like you go through the day and you, at the end of the day, you say, there was something I'm supposed to do today. And I just can't remember what it is. Right. Well, in this case of caregiving, it was like, I've got all these pieces to my puzzle. And, uh, the puzzle, the, the pieces get shook up often, mm -hmm. but that's, that's what it is. It's caregiving. It's caregiving. Now, in one sense of the word, even though I'm sure some experts would say it's not possible, but right now I'm caregiving myself. You must have been reading my mind what I was going to just ask you transferring care to yourself especially yes. after caregiving ends yes it uh, i'm always prone to say um you know there's two common aspects to caregiving there's a beginning and an end and we're not prepared for either one of those life-changing events and 
life after caregiving uh, can be just as hard. Yes. Both when you're caregiving for others and life after caregiving can be very, very lonely. Oh. <laughs> yes, it can be. Could be very lonely and prone to making poor decisions, emotional decisions. Oh, yes. Especially when you're in your in that cocoon where you, you don't really know where to turn. And again, that's another one of the reasons why I continue to do these podcasts and talk to awesome people like yourself, because if we just, you know, our, you know it's our stories that uh, break down barriers. Yes. Uh, and, you know, there's uh, that's, uh, where, what's my phrase here? It's through, it's through story sharing where diversity meets the road to collaborate on a common cause. And uh, you, know, you could be left, right, black, white, gay, straight, or everybody has a story. Absolutely. And they all connect in the caregiving sphere to one to three words: love, care, and commitment. Yeah. Everybody understands that. And you know, uh, one of the issues I had to deal with when I was caregiving, and to a certain extent, even now since they've both passed. But uh, when my wife and son were both alive and I was caregiving, I, there were a handful of people I trusted to stay with them for a short while because mm -hmm. I still attempted to pastor a church. I wasn't school teaching, but, uh, but I felt guilty when I'd go out and get a steak. Right. In fact, there was a restaurant here in town that you go in and there's this little cubby hole back this way that you can sit back there and eat and, and uh, the people don't know you're there. And I would ask, is there a table back there? Cause if I met someone that I really knew and there was having a steak and my wife was being tube fed, I would, I just would wonder yeah. what are they thinking about me? You know? Uh, wow. And uh, uh, just this unrealistic false guilt that sometimes that you have when you're a caregiver or our, our mind playing uh, mental gymnastics on us. And no, and no matter how much, many, how much training you have, uh, what the background is, it still happens. Oh, you know, absolutely. Absolutely. It still happens. Yeah. So what do you like to do for hobbies? <laughs> You know, as uh, as simple as this sounds, particularly like on a day like today, I love to get in the car and just drive. <laughs> uh, we have to be related, you know, because <laughs> that's what uh, I like. You know, I, I, I guess some people would call me a prude because I, I, even though I grew up on a farm, I really don't like to fish. I don't like to hunt. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't play golf. <laughs> I, I don't go drinking, <laughs> you know, I, uh, uh, but I love to travel. Uh, I wish I could travel more, mm -hmm. uh, not only uh, just for local recreation, but to travel to conferences and things. I used to mm -hmm. thoroughly enjoy that. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, I, I love to read. And uh, some people say this is a waste, but I love to read. I, I love to watch the old sitcoms that as I watch them, I think, did I really think those used to be funny? <laughs> you know, just, you know, but uh, uh, that, that's just what I like to do. Finding time for yourself. Yeah. It's amazing if we could do that while we're in the midst of caregiving. Yes. Easier I think said, part of the problem. Easier said than done. Yeah. yeah. I think, I, I, you know, I hate to admit this, but I think part of the problem sometimes when we're caregiving about feeling guilty, worried about what others will say if we go to town to take get a oh, steak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think maybe we 
thought some of those same things ourselves before we started caregiving about other caregivers. Interesting. Uh, you know, uh, 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 that's false guilt. I know it. And I've come to the conclusion that maybe they are thinking that, but most days, not all, but most days, my attitude is, you know what? That's their problem. <laughs> You know, right. If they don't like what they see, they don't have to look. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and uh, those of us like myself who have been caretakers and those who are in the ministry and those who are in schoolwork, we tend to have personalities where we worry about what others think. Right. Or we need to be needed. And we're, you know, there's that little voice. Mm -hmm. Well, what if you do these things? Do you think that this so and so was still like, you know, it's Approval. almost, and, and I know I'm picking on some people here, but it's almost like being a middle school girl. It just, you just have all these, <laughs> <laughs> isn't that terrible? I shouldn't have, I didn't say that, you know. Uh, but anyway, so that's, uh, I, that's I, where I, that, as the old saying goes, that's where it is. Uh, so if you, um, and I, first of all, I, I would love to do a whole series of podcasts with you on these on on the topic of grief and. No, I would. Uh, I would be very open to that. I, that's that. This this is not the the this is not the only time you and I are going to get together. I just want to I want to put that out publicly here on. on so on, so is that a threat or a warning? Or a, a little bit of both. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, what would you? What would you tell somebody today that has just come home from a diagnosis of cancer or that they're, they're thrust into the role of, of a caregiver without any, without any warning? What, what would you say to that person? Don't be shocked with your feelings and your thoughts. But at the same time, don't let those thoughts and feelings control you. And I know that's easier said than done. But um, if, if, if a caregiver is not careful, we can think ourselves into a down, down, down trend. Right. It's, it's so easy to do anyway as humans. But uh, don't be surprised at your feelings. Uh, a lot of caregivers will say to in their heart, maybe even to say out loud, I shouldn't feel this way. You know, uh, I shouldn't feel exhausted. I shouldn't feel angry that this is the eighth time today she's messed her pants. Okay, can I be that graphic? <laughs> yes, you can. Yes, you know, you can. And, uh, I, I, it's not that I'm trying to send a religion trip on people, but I think about those times, even Jesus said to his disciples after he taught and taught and he gave examples. And then finally he had to say, you guys just don't get it. Do you? <laughs> that is, that is, that is know, spot on. Yeah. Well, you know, even, just even at the Lord, uh, even at what we call the Lord's supper, uh, you know, after he explained what was going to happen, and he said about the betrayal, they started saying, well, who's he talking about? You know, they <laughs> didn't have a clue, apparently. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but like I said, uh, trust your, uh, don't be shocked with your feelings and your emotions. However, don't let them control you and, and uh, don't let them get, get you to the point that you may make some very poor choices. And that's easier said than done because the system, whatever that is, mm -hmm. where it's the school system, mental health, where it's education, physical health, whatever, they want you to make decisions right now. Right. You, you know, make this decision right now. You got to make it right minute. now. And I, uh, I have to, it's okay to take a step back. And it's okay to take a step back. And I would tell people, I said, now, when you tell that person that you can't make a decision right now, They'll say uh, they, they may have a body language where they say they don't like it. And, and that's just their problem. Mm -hmm. You know, um, 
I'd also tell families that there's a difference between moving on and just ignoring the problem. There's a difference between moving on and moving forward. Oh, goodness gracious, St. Ignatius. We could do a whole, we could do a whole show on that topic. Yeah. And a lot of that's, a lot of that's mental. We get it out, have to get it out of our head. It's again, easier said than done, but when when we can talk about it. Yeah. Uh, 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 it becomes just a tad bit easier and yeah. we can certainly, I think we could help a lot of people by doing, yeah. doing a show like that. Yeah. I'd be honored to do that with you. I don't, I don't know who said this first. I know I didn't. That's the only thing I know for sure. But I heard someone say one time about caregiving and a lot of other things in life says that you have to feel in order for it to heal. And I think we have wow. to we have to express it somehow, even though we may tell ourselves, or others may tell us, "Oh, you shouldn't feel that way. You shouldn't be angry at that special little child." I know with our son when we were caretaking him, it was so easy to say, "Well, he's special needs. Uh, we shouldn't correct him." And then finally, one day, a good friend said that same person that I told you about earlier, that was kind of like a velvet covered brick, right? said, you probably will always have a disabled child, but don't let him become a child that nobody wants to be around. Oh, my. So even though he was special needs and a lot of things he couldn't do, We know that when he would knock over a glass of milk, it really was accidental. You know, it wasn't that big of a deal. But we still had to discipline him. Mm -hmm. And we still had to, uh, when he was was three and four and five, he was still, he was physically able to go to town with us. And we would have to say, it's mom and dad's job to take things off the grocery shelves. It's not yours. And uh, he didn't like that. But we had to say, you know, we just don't do those things. Uh, but, but anyway, I don't know where I was going with that, but I just, no, uh, it's, uh, no. I th- you mentioned earlier about we assume caregiving is for old people. When your caregiving is for a child, you still have to find out, all right, what do we do here for discipline? Uh, and, and, uh, and you do it trial and error. Well, a lot caregiving is learn as you go. Absolutely. As I would imagine raising a child is. Yeah. You know, every once in a while, because I'm always in search of books and, and articles and journals about caregiving. And when I read the profile of the person who wrote the book, and it's obvious they've never done caregiving. I don't want that book. <laughs> you know, I went to a support group once and I asked the person in charge and, and, and bless her heart. She was a part of an organization. And since she was the new kid on the block, she got this job to be in this support group. This, uh, it was a, a group uh, for people who had lost a mate. And I just said to her one day, I said, uh, who have you lost in, in your life? She said, well, I had a great grandpa die once and I've had a couple of dogs and cats die, but that's about it. I never went back, (laughs) you know, and it's not that she wasn't a fine person. She's fine person, but she just, uh, she just couldn't relate. You have to feel it to understand it. You have to feel it to understand. Yeah. And you know, when I started officially, I guess if that is such a term, caregiving for my son first and then for my wife. As a pastor, I felt like I need to go back to all the people in my ministry who had done caregiving and apologize to them wow. for what I thought they should do, mm-hmm. you know, and what I thought how they should feel. 
That's a very powerful statement, Sam. Yeah. But I did it. I hate to use the word out of ignorance. So I'll say I was uninformed. <laughs> so there, mm -hmm. that's me. There's a whole lot. You see, we've already got our next three or four topics and you've How got that. I think you've got six or seven more books since we've talked today. So. <laughs> well, uh, you probably would have guessed that I'm a, I'm a pastor even without me telling you, I mean, I like to talk, but uh, in all humility, I have something people need to hear. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. And I uh, am so grateful for this opportunity today. I, uh, I likewise, I feel like I found a new best friend. So Sam, let all of our listeners know uh, how they can reach you through your, uh, your 5013C, your 5013C and, and all the great information that you have. Uh, please give out your contact information. Okay. Well, my 501C3, the official name of it is The Connection. Uh, I debated whether it should be connection or reconnection, but I've decided connection. And uh, the website simply is www.samtimbrook.com. Uh, and that's S A M. T-I-M-B-R-O-O-K. Some people try to put an E on the end, but it's www.samtimbrook.com. Uh, email is sam at samtimbrook.com. And we'll have all of Sam's uh, contact information in our show notes that you can access on all your favorite podcast platforms. And Sam, with the great work that you're doing, you are certainly someone who's creating healing ties all around us. I can't thank you enough for sharing your, your story and your wisdom with us today. And I look forward to collaborating and working with you down the road. Well, I, I would be honored. It is my joy. When I do things like this, I feel better. <laughs> it's a part of my healing. It's a part of, and that's what we're all about is healing. So Yes. Thanks, Sam, for sharing your wisdom on healing with us. And that does it for this episode of Healing Ties 2.0. I'm your host, Christopher McClellan. You might know me as the Bowtie Guy. I've created a life to love after caregiving ends by being with awesome people like Sam Timber and you. Thanks for listening. We'll see you for our final episode of Healing Ties real soon. Take care. Bye.